Can you see my screen, first of all? Yes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> well, it's a very big pleasure to be among you today. Um, thank you for giving me this space to, to speak about some ideas, uh, geometric ideas, uh, which can be applied to arithmetic and, and other fields. So my goal today is to, well, I believe that these notes should be already available uh, for you to, to read. To read. Uh, so my goal is not to be technical about uh, periodic geometry, but rather to send you an invitation to the subject because uh, the subject is not easy to to start with. It, it is very technical, and there are already really really good sources that discuss this kind of, of matters. So my my goal is to present you a, an introduction to some of the ideas that surround this kind of. Very well, so let me start by pointing out that everything, almost everything that I am going to say is already on the notes. So you can, if you miss something, you can, you can refer to them to try to catch. Uh, and some other things I, I will explain on the whiteboard, which I have here. Sorry, all right. So the first thing is that periodic geometry enters uh, inside uh, some uh, domain which is called um, non-archimedia analytic geometry, right? Because it makes uh, part of this uh, formalism since it has a, a non-archimedian, uh, sorry. So it enters inside the domain of non-Archimedean geometry since it has a non-Archimedean valuation. And uh, the methods that I'm going to discuss here are not uh, exclusive of Piatic's realm, but they can be applied to any uh, field equipped with a valuation, which is non-trivial and goes to the reals. We will get to that later. later. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I claim no new ideas uh, will not be presented here, just a discussion of some other people's works and perhaps the only original uh, content that you will find here is the presentation and the choose of the material. So uh, first of all, uh, uh, non archimedian algebraic geometry is presented as uh, as a corpus of knowledge, but sometimes it is not presented with a motivation. Uh, my motivation is going to be uh, just try to see how to apply it to algebraic geometry. And by algebraic geometry, I, under I will understand algebraic varieties, but not over the complex numbers, but uh, over over some particular kind of things. So the starting point is that uh, I have a, a very beautiful theory. If you don't know about this, uh, we'll get into, late, into details later. But the starting of all of this is that I have a category which is called uh, varieties over complex numbers. You can, I will be rather lax here by the meaning of variety. I don't want to be very technical. But um, there is a special around to another uh, category, which I will call C uh, some bars infinity uh, AN, right? So uh, this category is called uh, algebraic varieties. 
whatever that means. And this category is intended to represent complex analytic spaces. So I'm very happy to have met these kind of objects before in, in several talks. So this, uh, this is the thing for me, uh, defining these kind of objects. Anyways, uh, so if you know this theory, you know that this is very interesting because um, you can uh, somehow go from uh, some world which is just algeb algebraic. I mean, it is the, the, the main subject of uh, the left hand side is uh, algebras and uh, polynomials and uh, Sarisky topology and this kind of objects, right? And on the left, on the right, on the right side, uh, you have uh, analytic functions. You have uh, a refined topology. You have vector bundles. You have you have more flexibility. Right? But somehow these two guys uh, have a, an interaction. That they are very very uh, close to to each other in a very precise way. So uh, the first. The idea is how to, to go beyond this uh, identification in other worlds. And uh, somehow the first uh, example of, of topological field, which uh, were not the, the real numbers, was the reality field, right? So, um, so we have also the reals. But the reals embed into the complex numbers, and then the complex numbers take the lead, right? So I can treat real algebraic geometry as a category, as a subcategory of complex algebraic geometry, and then I can embed everything to this diagram. Not quite, but it's some some possible path. But let then uh, let me put here the periodics, which uh, I believe we have a very fair understanding of this. Uh, uh, now, and so uh, you have also here algebraic varieties over QP. And then um, what could be uh, something which I can put here so that I can reply, I'm sorry, replicate or some or take some uh, understanding of this fundamental category with other tools, perhaps analytic or convergent functions uh, expressed as a convergent power series uh, centered in, in my points, right? As, as a suite of complex numbers. So the fundamental uh, motivation is if you can uh, extend the, the analytification functor from complex numbers to other worlds. And just to be clear here, the, the world we are going to be referring to are the piads, right? So, um, uh, so this is the, the first motivation, right? How can we extend analytic methods beyond complex numbers? So, this was the motivation of our or ancestors, uh, ever since the, the, the discovering of periodic numbers, this has been a desire of the community. Uh, I just let me uh, tell you here that very recently, uh, these uh, methods that I'm going to discuss here have been, uh, how to say, um, emancipated from this uh, goal. I mean, they have taken, take, they have, they took their own, li their own life without the motivation of just serving as a tool for interpreting something which is very classical and beautiful in other words. So the second motivation is uh, makes sense of uh, analytic geometry without 
trying to copy. A complex algebra, complex analytic geometry. So this, this, is, this is a big uh, change of point of view because when you take something as a model, right? As a role model, you, you want to be like him or like her. You want to, to copy everything that the person or the thing does and to, to try to follow his or her steps. When you forget about these motivations, you can follow your own path and you can make your own mistakes and you can find your own, your own happiness. Right? So this, there is a breaking point here. And my talk is going to highlight this both, both of these aspects, I mean, First, uh, take a complex geometry, complex analytic geometry as a role model, and then trying to emancipate that point of view. Anyways, um, I will start very quickly with some uh, with some facts, right? Um, I will uh, work over a field, which is uh, algebraically close and of characteristic zero. Just let me let me put that concretely. Uh, from for me, K is going to be a, a an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. This is uh, just to to not have uh, problems with aditics, but you can uh, also drop this uh, these requirements. As I said, uh, this uh, setting is also valid for everything which is equipped with a rank one absolute value. Uh, more, on the, more on this later. So for me, variety is going to be, a, uh, you can think about it as a projective variety, or if you know some scheme theory, some integral separated algebraic scheme over this field. Um, so um, I really need uh, to treat uh, schemes, uh, varieties as a schemes. So um, you need to be aware of that. Uh, sometimes if we just stick with complex geometry, we can forget about genetic points. But in analytic, uh, in the in the geometry that I'm going to present, I really need uh, Generic points. So uh, you have you may have in mind that uh, a scheme, just a set with uh, some topology, which you see it's Sadisky topology. This topology has uh, has two kinds of points, uh, closed points from a topological point of view, from separable axioms of separation, closed points and generic points. Generic points are not closed points, and closed points are not generic points. So uh, something that is also very often forgot is that uh, schemes come equipped with a shift of uh, K algebras, right? And also that this box are not closed. So this is uh, all that I will, maybe uh, everything that is going to be needed for from scheme theory also, well, XK is uh, going to be the set of points. I will always take this uh, end out with uh, subspace topology. And if you want to read more about this, uh, I really recommend you the book by uh, Eisenbud and Harris, The Geometry of Schemes, if you want to know more about the philosophy of this, of scheme theory. Also, uh, the, the book by Liu is very recent, that's a good source of material. So um, uh, this is from the algebraic perspective, from the analytic perspective. Uh, uh, since uh, we are going now work in, in the intersection of two worlds. Here is the world of algebra or algebraic geometry. And here is um, the world of uh, analytic functions. Um, so anytime that you work in some intersection, you need to keep track of information from one side and information from the other side. Uh, so, from the algebraic geometry point of view, I already discussed my conventions and from analytic uh, point of view, we can uh, forget about these uh, requirements uh, in, in the first moment, but uh, we need to remember
and always that everything that is going to be considered here needs uh, the war, uh, the field to be complete, right? It has to be complete with respect to the uh, absolute value, which may be the PI equal. But uh, the, the important point of view of this paragraph is that you can forget about this uh, in a first moment, and then if you somehow forgot it, uh, there is no danger in doing this afterwards, after you have worked at your geometric uh, understanding. So the motivation, as I said, uh, I want to introduce this as a, not as a technical subject, but as a philosophical subject, is that if you take a, a variety over such a kind of fields, which is algebraic clause and uh, uh, characteristic zero, the left shift principle, if you don't know what this means, it means, roughly speaking, that the, the algebraic geometry is independent of the base field that you, the algebraic geometry of this object is independent of the, of the field that you may consider uh, as base field. So, um, of course, this is, this is true because the Sariski topology is really very general, right? I mean, you don't need to refer to particular characteristics of the field to define the Sariski topology in your varieties. You just need uh, polynomials and that's all. And polynomials are valid objects in any over any fields and over any ring. But uh, unfortunately, if you come with from the from the classical world, uh, I mean by world classical also a personal convention is uh, that for me classical is going to be the to mean the case, uh, complex case, right? So anytime I say classical, I refer to, to the base field K equals C. So one, one possible uh, problem or, or, or issue of uh, trying to understand varieties over other fields, which are not the complex numbers, is that uh, we don't have uh, the tools that we have over the complex numbers, and we will uh, try to justify that in a moment. So, for example, here is the first example. This is uh, intended to be an introductory le introduction lecture, so I'm not assuming that you are an expert on on, on scheme theory, right? So, uh, as I said, I need varieties as as, as a scheme. So, uh, let me introduce the affine line as the spectrum of uh, the algebra of univariate polynomials over a field. So, uh, you may you may try this as an exercise. Uh, the, the set of closed points of this uh, scheme is isomorphic to the field, to the, to the points of the field with the cofinite topology. In particular, one problem of this uh, space is that it is not separable, right? Uh, it is not housed or since any two open sets uh, intersect. Of course, this has, these open sets may not be uh, empty. So the key property of, 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 of varieties, right? If you don't know what is a algebraic scheme, uh, separable, blah, 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 over a field, so you may bear with this definition. Uh, the key property of the closed points of these varieties is that it locally embeds as a closed subset of, of the affine space, right? So uh, this is the defining property of an algebraic variety, x over k, is an algebraic variety if it embeds locally as a closed subset of some affine space. So you have here um, this defining property, but the Sariski topology on the closed points uh, of the affine space is also very coarse. This, this is Sariski topology. But somehow uh, we have here another topology to compare it, right? It is the product topology on the affine line. So this is a kind of a game in which we are trying to refine the topology so to, say, to be able to say more about the geometry of this object, right? So for the time being, I have I have two topologies, right? I have the I have Kn equipped with Sariski topology. 
and uh, this is uh, finer that KN equipped with the product topology. But, uh, and uh, maybe I, I have a chain of topologies, maybe not, I have a lattice, but uh, in the end, I have the discrete topology, right? So the discrete is like uh, the, the, the minimal point from the topological point of view on uh, you can displace yourself. And then you, you are trying to calibrate this kind of topologies, right? So if you change the topology of your field, you are going to get a topology on a defined space. And maybe there are some interesting topologies to, to look at here so that you can embed your, you can endow your varieties which are locally embedded here with these topologies. That's the principle. So uh, already uh, again, referring myself to the classical case, uh, the first natural choice topology uh, which you can endow a field with is the usual Euclidean topology on the affine, complex affine space. And uh, well, CN is not just a set, it's a topological space. So let me denote the complex numbers raised to the nth power with the, the usual Euclidean topology as CN infinity. Uh, this notation is going to be also explained. So uh, as I said, this is, uh, this is just the beginning of this path, right? It's uh, the analytification path. Uh, in fact, uh, infinity is disguised here. I can uh, try to change this pair by a topological field instead of looking at it as a, as a field together with an absolute value, right? It is the same thing. Uh, so uh, these are complex analytic spaces. Uh, it was a very natural choice from for our ancestors. Uh, both from classical notions and also for the beauty of the theory. It is an extremely beautiful theory, uh, which I recommend you to, to look, to take a look at. So anyways, uh, this was uh, changing the topology from the Sariski topology, right? We have, which we have here to the, to the Euclidean topology was the starting of this uh, story. This is, uh, this is analytification. And somehow this says that you may choose an, a topological space with a topology which is not uh, very flexible. It is a risk, it is not a Hausdorff. And somehow you, you have the tools to, to construct a topological space which is Hausdorff and which is nice. Just by changing the topology of your field. Here you have C Sariski, and here you have C analytic. So this was the motivation of all these kind of stories. Namely, you can take uh, your scheme and you can assign to it uh, the analytification. And this guy is not just a topological space. It is a topological space uh, to just change, as I said, uh, you refer to your chain of topologies. So somehow here it is uh, CN and so on. So you have, uh, perhaps uh, I made a mistake here. This is product and this is Sariski. So somehow uh, if K is equal to C, you have here uh, another guy which is uh, CN uh, Euclidean. And what you do is just embed your, your algebraic variety locally inside CN and you change the topology, that's all. And, and somehow you can also do, do this for shifts. So uh, in particular, the structure shift uh, may be an LT5. And in this sense, uh, when you do this process to the structure shift, uh, you don't see, you no longer see the regular functions uh, from algebraic geometry, but just start seeing analytic things like uh, convergent power series, right? 
Uh, so let me go to the for to the next page. Okay. So the first example is uh, well, kind of the first example is what happens if you take the projected line. So I will take here the pros associated to the uh, graded ring into variables, right? Or you can glue two copies of the fine line if you know how to do it. So uh, here, the close points is just the complex projective line. I mean, you take C times C, you take away the origin, you factor to the action of the torus, and this gives you a set, right? Just a set. But you may dress this set with different topologies. And if you come from a right geometry, you put the Sarisky topology, and this is just opens our complements of finite sets, right? And if you do this analytification process that I described now, you just change the dress. You keep the set, but the dress is changed for the Euclidean dress. So this has to, the result is twofold to uh, change the topology, but you also change the shift. Now the shift, uh, since the topology is finer, you, you may take uh, smaller open sets and the shift, the analytified shift over these smaller sets are going to be precisely the analytic functions that you see in a first course of complex variables. So the reason uh, you may wonder why do you get this kind of, of functions? And the reason is not uh, mysterious. It is because um, uh, in fact, uh, the complex line endowed with the Euclidean topology is a particular case of a valid field. Uh, you may uh, remember the traditional absolute value, which assigns a complex number, the, the positive square root of uh, the product with it, of itself with a complex conjugated. And this is an absolute value, right? This is a function which is subadditive, which is multiplicative, and which uh, sends zero to zero. So it's a norm. And now we have uh, another example in mind at our disposal, which is the periodic, right? To construct the periodic, we just take the direct limit of the quotients of set by the powers of the ideal generated by a prime number. This uh, extends to the valuation. If I express the number, the periodic numbers as a sequence, uh, and then uh, I extend the absolute value to the, to the residue field. So I'm sorry, to the fraction field. So this is also an absolute value uh, induced by evaluation, right? So uh, it is, the, and this guy induces a topology on QP. So if I come back to my motivation, um, just let me, let me clear here. Uh, well, I have, I have, QP with the metric topology induced by the uh, by the periodic absolute value. I may raise this to the n power and endow this guy with the product topology, and uh, maybe I can do something similar with to which uh, I did uh, from with CN, right? Namely, uh, I have here my variety. I take a patch, this guy is a spec, K, X divided by I. So it means that here I have K to the N and this guy embeds as a closed subset here, right? This is some chart, P of U, this is U. And then, I can try to equip this uh, Q. Well, let me put here Q. Pn. Let me put here Q, QP. I may try to equip this uh, QPN with uh, the metric topology. Right? And then change 
the, the Sariski topology, which this set bears, with the induced topology of the immersion given by phi uh, when I change the dress. So this is a very natural idea since this is what we do for the complex case. And what I'm saying is that uh, these two cases are very similar. I mean, uh, you have you have two functions, right? Which uh, have the same properties. They are absolute values. So the, the topology is induced by the same uh, mean. I mean, uh, by the same uh, technology, which is an absolute value. Why not try to do this? And the, the answer is that this doesn't work for topological reasons. So by now you should have seen uh, in the course of medium, uh, the difficulties of trying to make this work uh, in the sense that uh, metric topologies induced by absolute values uh, there is a dichotomy in them. Uh, I mean, it is uh, either Archimedean or non-Archimedean, right? And the topology of non-Archimedean spaces is rather special because it is uh, totally disconnected. Uh, if you, I, I, I hope that you have seen this. If you were not present, then I said uh, in one sentence, what is the problem, right? So we, we kind of mixed here the, both, uh, both uh, contents. So I put here return to geometry, right? So, um, so just to answer before the break, just to answer the question why this is not a valid, uh, well, it is valid, but you will get uh, nothing interesting. So um, the question is uh, why don't we do here? Don't we repeat the argument? the construction. And uh, the answer is that uh, QP endowed with uh, its metric topology uh, is totally discrete. Uh, and this is bad because um, this is not this does not happen to when for the complex case. I mean, uh, when you take the complex uh, with uh, this, you get something very beautiful. You get something which is also right. And uh, this guy he is totally discrete. I mean, it is house of course, but it is totally discrete. So uh, concretely, this means that if you have an open subset of this guy, then uh, U is connected if and only if U is a point. So already there have been, so I'm, I'm going to finish with this uh, historical remark. Uh, our ancestors try to to remedy this, right? So uh, you may imagine a Cantor set or, I mean, Cantor inside R, or you may imagine the Russian inside R, right? These are um, examples of totally disconnected spaces. And then you may try to study functions which go from rationals to the rationals. This guy endowed with the subspace topology from its inclusion in the reals. And then you try, you may try to, to study functions from here to here, which are locally expressible as a convergent power series. Of course, uh, uh, we are talking about convergent power series because this topology is metric. 
So it makes sense to try to understand uh, convergent power series from a, from, a, from a metric point of view. Of course, this guy is not complete. So I will, next thing I will do is to complete and try to make this comparison uh, more striking. Uh, anyways, if you, if you try to do this uh, in a naive way, you will be blocked by reality because, uh, because there are no analytic functions in this set. Because the topology is very, is very, is very, uh, is not coarse enough. If you try to glue some, some, of, uh, some open sets, your function is going to fall to the sand like topology of this set. So there is a fundamental problem here, which is from topological nature. And this is why what we are going to try to fix in the next uh, sessions. So I believe that uh, I, we have some break if, if I'm not uh, wrong, if not, I can continue. Uh, yes, we have a 10 minutes break starting now, if you want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I got a little ahead of myself uh, last time. As I said, uh, you have to worry about details here. So what we do is, um, is the following, uh, you have here, uh, your complex numbers. Uh, this guy is already a Hausdorff topological field. Uh, it is also Banach in the sense that it is complete. Uh, you have you can do the same thing with the Piadics uh, if you if you just need to take this as a fact. If you don't know or if you don't care, this guy has a, has a metric completion. Well, first I need to do it algebraically closed. I make this guy algebraically closed. Uh, the value extends uniquely to any algebra extension. So there is no problem in extending the value. And then I complete this as a metric space. Of course, the, the absolute value extends by continuity to the completion. The big uh, deal is that, uh, so this is a complete, complete metric space, which I will call a CP. Uh, it is also a fact that it remains algebraically closed. Okay. So we have two fundamental objects, uh, which is C infinity and which is CP. These guys are from the algebraic point of view and from the analytic point of view, they are algebraically closed of characteristic zero. And from the analytic point of view, they are complete household fields. So they, they, they share a lot of characteristics. Of course, I said that uh, the fundamental difference is that uh, C infinity is Archimedean and uh, CP is non Archimedean. And uh, I just remind you that uh, this is uh, uh, a theorem that uh, the world is non Archimedean in the sense that. Uh, if you take here the collection of valued fields in the sense that they are uh, 
complete fields with respect to uh, an absolute value. Then uh, you have a crew here, which is C infinity. Uh, it's closing or infinity. And uh, these guy are these guys are separated from from the crowd. Everything else, any field which is of this type, which is not uh, C infinity or R infinity, is uh, non archimedean And uh, as a as a result, uh, the the metric space that you will get from metric completion is going to be uh, totally disconnected. So perhaps you, you, you thought that you may apply complex methods to other kind of fields, not precisely the theatics, but this theorem is telling you that this is impossible. And I, I want to stress the beauty of this statement, which is saying that uh, complex algebraic geometry, complex analytic geometry, and real analytic geometry are really two special guys, right? They, they cannot be uh, mimicked. You cannot mimic the, the theory that happens with these two guys. Anyways, I just wanted to, to put that concretely for the record. Uh, here we have uh, the part of medium, which is uh, about the added integration. So the first, uh, I told you that the problem was that, uh, that totally disconnected topological spaces are sound-like. I mean, you don't have, uh, you don't have much, uh, texture to work with. So uh, around 1960, uh, John Tate, uh, looking at the striking uh, similitudes, uh, similarities between C infinity and CP. So you may, if you don't feel uh, comfortable working with CP, you can work with QP. And then we do all this, all this process that I described above here in, in equation star. You go to the algebraic closure and then you complete everything. Uh, so John Tate was saying, okay, uh, in complex geometry, uh, for example, complex algebraic curves, we have, uh, just let me stick with curves, and then I will say a word about gen some generalizations. You have the, the beautiful uniformization theorems. Uh, which is, uh, which is um, a statement about an identification of an algebraic curve, right? And then if I, I take here C and I take here QP, right? And uh, by the left shift principle, uh, from an algebraic point of view, I can look at algebraic curves over QP. And since what, uh, uh, let me take the algebraic closure. And since these two guys are algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero, nothing changes from an algebraic point of view. I mean, a complex algebraic curve is the same as a theatic algebraic curve from an algebraic point of view. Nevertheless, when you when you analytify uh, you get the uniformization theorems, which says that roughly speaking, uh, you can uh, cover uh, your complex curve with uh, simply connected topological space, which is Hausdorff, and you see a lot of geometry there, right? So uh, this is roughly speaking cover 
your space with a simply connected. logical space and so john tate said okay uh, can we uh, replicate this theory here right so the first case which uh, which is interesting is the torus so i i know that the details are here. Um, just let me tell you the basics. Uh, if you have uh, your complex curve of genus one, uh, and this is the really the analytification, right? It is not uh, the algebraic curve. Then uh, you can uh, go to C. Two and you you may find two vectors here, uh, the vector one and another one. So such that if you take the lattice, I mean the discrete group generated by these two guys. Let me call it lambda. Uh, the projection from C two to the I'm sorry here is C. The projection from here to here uh, gives you a uh, biolomorphism. So this is uh, isomorphic to X and A N. So uh, John Tate was trying to recover this kind of theory from the periodic point of view. So the problem, as we said, is that uh, the topology is not uh, very good. He first, the first thing we have to do is to change the complex uniformization. Right? Uh, we, instead of taking uh, the classical uniformization, which is here expressed here in the equation 11, you change uh, to Jacobi's uniformization. And this is a uh, very interesting exercise. You can show that. Uh, uh, there is a complex number which is non-zero and whose norm is uh, which is located in the unit disk such that uh, the complex analytic space that you get when you analytify your elliptic curve is isomorphic to the quotient of the algebraic torus divided by the discrete group generated by this element. So the way to do this is to use algebraic groups. I mean, there is a uh, an isomorphism between the additive. I'm, I'm not. I'm sorry. Not an isomorphism. There is a morphism of algebraic groups which goes to the from the additive to the multiplicative, and it is the exponential function. And if you assume the validity of equation eleven, then this is all you need to show this uh, different uniformization. So just let me uh, before going into the details, let me just uh, say that uh, there exists the concept of periodic analytic space. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if we come back to the starting point, there is uh, a category here. Which is CP. And or I may uh, write this as QP, P. it doesn't matter. Uh, there is, this category exists. And this process from going to here, from here to here exists. As our initial motivation was, was to re Re replicate what we had in complex world in in in, a, in periodic world, right? So the the point of this second session, the second part of the first session, is that this exists, but it cannot be done naively. You cannot copy directly what you do 
over the complex numbers and just adapt to the periodics. You need to do something else. And something else is what uh, John Day did. The, the, the explanation is here. XP, so just to, just to complete, uh, uh, yes, so you have here, you have here uh, X and you somehow assign to X and so here also I have a, uh, I have X and I assign to it XN. But just for psychological reasons, let me call this X brief. Because it is not the same approach. If if it should if it would be the same approach, I would put here XN for psychological reasons, just to remind you that you do the same thing but it is not. So let me call it rigid but for, for rigid space. And let me tell you how, how, to, how to do it. This concretely for, for, for this case, right? So uh, the functor of an amplification from varieties to rigid spaces is going to be X sent to X read. And what I'm telling you is that uh, X read exists but it is not just the rational points of the variety. This F is intended to represent QP alpha. Uh, and then I take the closure. The details are on the notes. Uh, you cannot do this just by taking rational close points of your variety and then endowing it, it with the meta topology. You have to do something else. And this something else is just to rigidify the topology. I told you that the topology was sand-like. And by refining, uh, we mean uh, to construct a grotten topology. Uh, and, as, and if you were present yesterday in the course of Felipe, uh, you already have a good understanding on grotten topologies. They are, uh, they are uh, categories equipped with uh, family of covers, and then you try to mimic uh, geometry using uh, diagrams, right? But the problem is that, uh, is that geometry is, there is a fundamental way in which sight acts through the brain. Uh, I mean, rigid uh, sights and this technology of rotten topologies is great because you can do some kind of, of geometry in the form of shift homology. Uh, and this is the big point. This was the big point of, of yesterday's discussion, right? But some persons and some, some part of our brains really crave for doing pictures or to get our hands in some object which we can manipulate. So uh, just let me tell you here what happens for, for the elliptic curve. And then we will discuss the details of the construction of the topology in this, in this uh, setting. So what you do is uh, copy Jacobi's uniformization from the complex uh, case to the periodic case, right? So it, this is saying that as you can find here, the, the, the key is equation 12. In equation 12, I'm saying that you can find a periodic number, which is non zero, such that its periodic norm is uh, bounded by one, so that this space that I'm going to discuss now makes sense. This is a group. When you take the quotient of this, uh, this space by this group, you find an isomorphism in the category of rigid spaces when you take the close points of your elliptic curve equipped with a rigid topology, which is a rotten topology. 
So this is saying that they was correct. I mean, there is uh, there is a complex uniformization because if you compare equations 11 and 12, they are the same. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, if you compare uh, this equation 12 with this uh, exercise, right? They are exactly the same state. So everything is uh, controlled by this concept of bridge. So let me tell you how to do it. I am going to discuss some philosophy now. Uh, basically, what we do is to rigidify. So you may think of this as the following analogy. Just let me get right very quickly. So imagine that you go to the beach. Right here are the you have the sun here. And imagine that you go to the beach and you want to make some buildings out of the sand. Of course, uh, you need some kind of, of instrument to do, to do buildings, right? Uh, maybe a bucket. So what you do is to take the sand, put it in the bucket, and then when you do the bucket like this, the sand comes with some prefabricated form. But this uh, this uh, prefabricated block is made of sand. but it is no longer sand. And your capacity of, of constructing is limited by your model. Uh, for example, if you take another kind of recipient, uh, maybe rectangular, then uh, the blocks that you are going to get are copies of it. And some particular shape may be more convenient than others for your purposes. So this is what uh, rigid geometry does for you. Rigid geometry uh, gives you some uh, shapes in which you can put sand inside. And then when, you, when the sand comes out from the recipients, you get blocks. And then you use these blocks to construct buildings. But the buildings, even if they are made of sand, they are not sandy-like more. They are, they are blocks. They are constructions made by prefabricated blocks. And these blocks are called affinoid domains. So this is the rigidification process. In theory, you have all the sun in the world and all the possibilities are open for you. But in reality, this doesn't work because the sand is not good for building. So what rigid geometry does for you is to give you some particular shapes. It takes sand and it gives you blocks. And with these blocks, which are called affinoid domains, you make your rigid spaces. So to finish the... The analogy, let me uh, also I want to stress that this process is very similar to the construction of schemes. Um, yeah, uh, rigidification is uh, philosophically similar to the construction. Of schemes. And let's go back in time. I mean, this was in the 60s. Uh, all the flurry of applications of shift theory uh, from uh, differential equations to geometry came in the 50s by, the, by very big names, right? So 
uh, around this, uh, this decade, the concept of scheme appeared in algebraic geometry. So it was natural for John Tate to look at this kind of modern development of algebraic geometry to inspire himself about the concept of rigid geometry. Anyways, I am doing here for you a comparison between uh, the two uh, approaches to algebraic geometry and analytic geometry. So for example, uh, what is an affinoid domain? An affinoid domain is our local building block. So if you, uh, let me, yes. So in the left-hand side, I have uh, what we do in algebraic geometry, uh, in particular for varieties, not for schemes in general. And on the right side, I made the uh, discussion for rigid spaces, right? So uh, again, what is a rigid space? A rigid space is, uh, is something that you can build out of a finoid domain. So uh, for varieties over this field F, which is the completion of the algebraic closure of the periodics, since I need the uh, technical details for working uh, properly. So the building blocks, I told you that uh, they are uh, families of zero sets uh, inside some affine space. And for rigid spaces, your building blocks or your affinoid domains are going to be sets of zeros in the unit polities of some family of analytic functions. Okay, so there is no, I, I'm not making uh, all the details, I'm just saying that. Uh, since I have a metric here, uh, this um, this is intended to be uh, all the vectors x1 up to xn, such that the periodic norm of xi is less or equal than one for all i, right? So it is the unit polity, the product of of the unit disk, and I have uh, the concept of unit since I have a metric. Anyways, uh, so I have some kind of functions which I can interpret as analytic functions over this uh, set. I will tell you later which are these. And I'm saying that the local models that I'm going to allow are those that can be described as a zero set of some family of analytic functions inside this space, as I said for for varieties, right? For algebraic varieties, I can allow local models which are zero sets of polynomials in some of my space. Uh, later then, algebraically, how do you this, how do you go from geometry from algebra to algebra, right? So here is the passage from geometry to algebra. And here is the same. We are going from geometry to algebra. And we want both tools to help us understand this problem. So algebraically, you can reformulate this uh, condition as uh, the spectra of, uh, of algebras which are of any type over K, right? And uh, algebraically and in, on the right side, you can do the same. You can say that uh, your algebras or your points are going to be described as maximal spectra of some particular kind of algebras which are called affinoid algebras, right? And um, this is all you need because now you use the fundamental tool from scheme theory, which says that you can, anytime that you have a good algebraic category, you can make geometry out of it just by uh, taking the opposite category. 
and interpreting the opposite objects or the opposite world as the geometric objects, right? So the geometric objects are the opposite guys and the algebraic objects are the, the, the regular guys. And so what I'm saying here is that there is an analogous category in which you take into account the norm that you, the periodic norm that you get here. And this is, tells you that you can define an algebraic category, which is the category of affinoid domains. And you can do geometry just by taking the opposite category and the change between the two worlds is uh, taking, instead of all the prime ideas, you just take the maximal ideas. The return to algebraic world is just taking uh, global sections. And uh, here is the same, right? So uh, just let me tell you what is an affinoid algebra. Uh, so an affine algebra. And here, affinoid. So there is some, um, some, if you have an algebra, here you have an algebra, but this over QP and this over CP. So uh, the, the difference between QP uh, and CP is that I am considering this guy as a topological space. And uh, QP is not, it can be considered just as a field, but it, it does not need to have an analytic structure. So affinoids are defined in the same way since I have here a, a global model and I have here another global model. And I will say that R is an affine algebra if I get uh, an epimorphism from my affine model to the algebra. And I will say that AN is a affinoid if I get an epimorphism from the affine algebra to A. So what is KN? KN is just K, X1 up to Xn, right? And what is TN? TN is a formal series. I'm sorry, here I'm just, yes. Are the formal series in, uh, sorry, let me put the same, uh, X1 up to Xn, such that the limit of the periodic norm of the coefficients is zero when the norm of the vector is infinite. And here by norm of the vector is just the sum of the right? So this is my local model. This is called the theta algebra. And this is called an affine algebra or, 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 or a polynomial algebra. And what I'm saying is that the approach to affinoid things is the same if you change the model. And since the, say, the approach is the same, maybe we can call this affine, why not? And at the end of the of my lectures, I want to combine you that this is valid. It is it has the right to call itself affine because it is the same process. If we call it affino, it is for, for historical reasons, and also not to get confused with the, what we already do in algebra. Right. Anyways, um, after that. You, you say, okay, so far so good. I have 
Dice equivalence between algebra and geometry given by two categories. One is the opposite of the other, and they have two functors which link them uh, good in a fine way. So after that, you look at the pair that you get, which is uh, you, you mix the information uh, from the geometry from um, the algebra. And so you have a set in the left hand side, you have the prime ideals together with the ring, which gives you the shift. And on the, on the right side, you have the maximal ideals of your affine, affinoid algebra together with the ring or the Banach algebra, which should give you the shift. So this is, uh, and after that, we can try to glue. These are or, or sand or blocks of sand. Uh, or affinoid that I, I said uh, before. So then you continue the identification. If you know some scheme theory, then you know that any, any element of the ring gives you a regular function, but the regular function is just the image of your element uh, into the residue field, right? And uh, you can use this, um, you can use this uh, process to induce the topology on the scheme uh, just by declaring that the complements of the zero locus of this evaluation should be open. And then you see that uh, the family of basic open sets in which uh, you declare uh, them to be uh, the complements of the zero of the zero locus of this regular function is uh, has some very nice properties with respect to basis of topologies, and then you generate a discrete topology in this way. And then the shift, once you have, once you have these, you can define the shift uh, just by inverting the function that does not vanish there. And the function that does not vanish there is by definition the function that you took away. So this is the whole construction of schemes. Now, let me go to the analytic part. You also have, a, if you have an element of your affinoid uh, algebra, which is A, this induces a map. Uh, just take a, a close point of the max or a maximal ideal, a close point of your space or a maximal ideal of the algebra is the same. And then instead of uh, stopping at the image uh, in the residue field, since the residue field is an extension of the base and the base is algebraically closed and this extension is algebraic, it says that this extension is also a cube, is also CP. So you may take the valuation, which you already have defined there. And this gives you this function, which is not, does not land into an arbitrary field, but it lands in R. And then you can try to pull back the topology of these functions to put a topology on the maximal spectra of, of these uh, algebras in this way. So there is a form of doing this by taking what is called uh, rational domains. So rational domains are described by inequalities and they are the analogs in the affinoid world of the uh, basis of the Sarisky topology in the algebraic world. So I'm just saying that, that these guys behave well with respect to, to the uh, quality of being a basis of a topology. And then uh, finally, you close, the, you close the door by looking at the fact that uh, precisely the, the maximal spectrum of some localization of some quotient of some uh, extension of this algebra. I'm sorry, the, here is a, it should be the affinoid algebra. Gives you precisely this, um, this set. So just to take the last minutes of my participation, first participation here, what I'm saying is that you have here, for example, a spec R, and you have here max A. And then what you do is to, is to take EF. EF is, uh, let me call this U, U man, minus the zero locus of F. 
And here, what you take is, uh, what you take is uh, two guys in the algebra, in the algebra. And here, F is in R. And then you take UFG. which is uh, the X in max A, such that uh, F of X norm, that's what equal than G of X. And the reason behind these choices is that DF is spec R T divided by TF minus one. So this is just uh, uh, R adding uh, an inverse for F. And this uh, set, this is UFE, is also given by the max of some algebra, which is A, you add some new constant, and then you divide by T. Minus one f something like this. Let me just check. Yes, so so is g x minus f. Yeah, here is g t. So, so the striking the, the 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 similarities are striking. I mean, you may think, okay, I won because I am. I am describing a family of set as spectra of some particular kind of algebras which I control. In this case are affinoid algebras, and in this case are affine algebras. So I can copy, maybe I can copy the setting and define a shift using this affinoid, this rational one. So this is the next question. And this question will be addressed next time. Uh, and the answer, of course, is you can do that. Because rational domains are not good enough to work. So rational domains have to be rigidified by introducing a growth in the topology. So uh, I think I will end here.